complex, the Bible is complex. Human existence is a tangled ball of experience, perception, and understanding. Ravel is a puzzling word, denoting both a tangling and untangling. This podcast attempts to hold honest conversations in good faith. Some ideas expressed in this podcast will be challenging. Others will be obvious. When a PhD in biblical interpretation and a habitually podcasting man-child discuss matters of society, scripture, and scandal, you get Ravel. Hey everybody, you are listening to Ravel, and it's me, your best buddy Basil. And with me as always is the unambiguous, the apprehensible, the by and large intelligible Dr. Christopher Ryan. (laughs) Yes, yes. Up, buddy? Hey, what's up? Mm, uh, nothing. Just had a wonderful conversation with Phil Porto, who is our guest for today. Um, yeah, just just to not beat around the bush here, he is the uh, prop- proprietor, the the principal uh, of uh, what is it? Gospel and the arts. Gospel and the arts. It's a great. Um, what is it? A ministry? It's a ministry. Yeah. 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 That's, I, I guess we never really defined it with him, but no. it's it's a wonderful ministry um, that is focused on artists in the church, uh, equipping them and uh, preparing them, and and also uh, equipping the church with the knowledge and understanding of what is an artist, why are they so important, and what can we do to continue uh, the uh, you know the the fostering the growth of uh artists in the church and just why that's so important it's pretty cool i mean it it seems to be a a unique sort of mission that i haven't quite heard anybody else focusing on so um pretty cool fella also very talented photographer and uh chris you know this guy you know him yeah yeah uh we uh we met through um church uh some time ago and uh yeah he's just a great guy not a real close friend of mine but definitely i I would consider him a good friend and um uh, always has just been a solid dude and as we were starting this series about talking about art and and artists and you know my kind of proclivity to kind of just always want to tie everything into scripture i was thinking about oh man there's this ministry gospel and the arts that uh phil we should get phil on here and uh yeah it was a really really great conversation he talks a little bit about his music uh career in the past though we don't have any uh links for any of those things but uh perhaps we Mm. can get some but kind of from a young age always had been an artist and then of course in his ministry he he works with a lot of artists so i thought it would just be a really unique perspective to have him come on as we're getting into kind of the series and talking and kind of exploring you know the world and and our faith and all of those things through you know uh the minds of artists so uh yeah. i think it's going to be I think everybody's going to really really enjoy it yeah lots of really cool topics we get uh you know we have some fun we get deep we talk about uh like i mentioned artists and their role in the church and how artists and the church uh, can interact better uh to benefit each other uh, as well as the, the, the sort of universal um, experience of m- misunderstanding or understanding and how that plays into the roles of the artist, but also the character of God. And um, yeah, so make sure to check out a lot of uh, other things that Phil Porto is doing. He's got a YouTube channel. Um, he's got it's just Phil Porto there. He For those of you who are... Uh, photographers he's got a lot of great content on there to help you uh, improve in your photography or just commiserate i guess um he's also <laughs> of course got his own uh instagram account uh, at phil porto and yeah i think that's a lot of things yeah. um this was a, a unique episode i mean i think we talked more 
about the artist experience in this one um, than any of the other ones. Of, of course, we touch on it uh, in, in all of the episodes in this series, but really a fun deep dive into uh, the, the sort of special being that is an artist. And of course, you may think to yourself, well, I'm not an artist. And well, maybe you're going to want to pay attention anyways, because you might notice that the uh, motivations and the mindsets of what we might call sort of the archetypal artist, um, the thing that makes them so effective at what they do is because they are universal. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think it's great. I'm very excited for people to hear this one. Yeah, yeah, me too. I don't really mm -hmm. think I have anything else to say to, to set it up. Well, I think we better just get into it then. All right, folks, take out those easels, lick your paintbrush, dip it on into that little, little, little nugget of uh, watercolor and just start splashing it all over the place because that's what we're doing oh here and just more of like a, you know, like a podcast audio form. Uh, but you get it. It's metaphors, man. Artists love <laughs> metaphors. So, uh, yeah. You're like the podcasting version of Bob Ross. <laughs> That's the nicest thing anybody's ever said about me. Thank you very much. And I'm glad that it's on the podcast, recorded forever. And, um, yeah, that will now demand that everybody call me that. Whenever introducing me, uh, they have to mention that I'm the Bob Ross of podcasting. Um, I'm going to go put it on my Twitter bio and make a website right now. So while I do that, you guys listen to this interview. Here we go. And with us today, we have Phil Porto, the photographer, the musician, and the curator of Gospel and the Arts, uh, as well as the host of the Fellow Citizens podcast, Phil, are you there? I am here. Thank you guys so much for having me. You're coming in yeah. nice and clear. We appreciate your time today. And uh, you know this. We've talked about this. But for sort of the um, simulacra that is a podcast, just uh, we are continuing our series on uh, artists. Artists on is what we're calling it. We just named it that, and we're like three <laughs> episodes in. So you're the first, you are literally the first person uh, to hear those words. Well, I feel out, honored, out thank you. Yeah, well good, you are. We'll, uh, we'll put that in the, we'll edit that out actually. We don't, <laughs> don't leave that in there. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, how are you doing, Phil? Thanks for being here. Tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I'm doing well. Um, so, yeah, like you said in the intro, you know, I am currently a professional uh, photographer and videographer, and um, I've been doing that about 10 years full time. Um, mm. Previous to doing photo and video as a profession, um, I was the vocalist of a spirit filled hardcore band, and I spent most of my time uh, <laughs> traveling and just making music. I gotta. I'm sorry. I gotta pause you right there. You said a spirit filled. I was gonna band. comment yes, on <laughs> that as well, Chris, yes, because that is a great way to categorize it. Because you don't want to be a Christian hardcore band. No, definitely spirit -filled not. Spirit filled hardcore band is way cooler. Definitely. I come back to the rest of your story, but please tell us about the spirit filled hardcore. Yeah. Band. We gotta, so so we gotta hear so, about this. So so there is you know va variations. You know there was. A, a time where, you know, in the punk rock hardcore scene, you know, there were uh, Christian hardcore bands. Um, and, and a lot of times those people got pretty bad reputations within the actual hardcore scene. Um, mm -hmm. Playing, you know, Christian festivals, it was fine. You know, you have a whole bunch of youth group kids coming to your shows. Um, but a lot of these Christian hardcore bands put a really poor taste in the actual hardcore scene's mouth um, because of lifestyles not really matching up to uh, the, the lyrics, so to speak, from, from the music. Um, and there was a giant disconnect. And so, you know, we weren't really your Christian hardcore band that was touring the church circuit all the time. 
Um, most of our tours were with unbelieving, you know, unbelievers. Um, most bands that actually like despised Christianity as a whole. Um, but building that relationship with them, you know, and then being able to see that like our lives kind of matched what we were staying from the stage as well as what our lyrics were, you know, about, um, kind of built relationships that that title Christian hardcore band wouldn't really, um, have allowed. And so there was quite a bit of us who, you know, had that title in the early 2000s that it was a spirit filled hardcore band, um, because we were doing it because we felt it was our ministry and we felt it's what the Lord wanted us to do. Uh, not because we wanted to fit into a specific genre. We just had the Holy spirit in us and we wanted to declare it to a music scene that we were passionate about. That is so cool. cool. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. I don't know, Chris, I don't know if we've talked about this, but did you have a like a hardcore face, metal face, punk face? Uh, mine came late in life. I was in my I was in my mid to late 20s when mine came. I know that most people experience it uh, earlier in life, but yes, uh, I was my late mine came bloomer. late. Yeah, it was I finally just gave in cuz all my friends were into it and my brothers and everybody was is super into yeah. it, and I was much more into the mellower stuff. But mm. eventually, yes, I had a I okay. had a hardcore phase. Oh, I w- had a major hardcore phase in uh, probably uh, probably just throughout high school, uh, and specifically Christian hardcore phase. Uh, oh, yeah, you for know, sure. being a, a teen, didn't have a whole lot of responsibilities, so went to all the festivals, all the shows all the things um so you know the the christian hardcore or spirit filled hardcore uh, <laughs> occupies <laughs> occupies a pretty large portion uh of my developmental sort of algorithms do you mind if i ask you what your band was called yeah so the band was called the red baron um Ooh. and so we used to you know when we did play the festivals it was pretty much cornerstone festival in bushnell illinois mm-hmm. Um, and so, so yeah, so we played probably with a lot of the bands that, uh, that you probably, uh, knew and you enjoyed, um, whether it was Christian or spirit filled, however you want to categorize it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, we, we, we played with a lot of, a lot of those bands. Um, ah, so. I love it. I love it. And you know, it's, I, you know, it feels a little early to like get into sort of the abstract thought here. Um, but I'm just going to do it anyways, cause I don't want to miss it. Um, and it is so ac- applicable to what <laughs> we're talking about here, right here. You know, you're talking about the, the labels yeah. of Christian. And, you know, I think that's very cool that you kind of went for another label uh, of spirit filled. Um, but it's also is kind of in that very interesting conundrum that a lot of artists, if not all artists have to deal with, which is sort of explaining yourself yeah explain yourself and explain your art because i want to know what i'm getting into before i experience your work and uh that that can have so many different ups and downs to it as you mentioned yeah if you call yourself a christian band then you're not acting like a christian band when you play shows or go on tour or whatever uh it's there's like a strange, I don't know exactly how to put it. I, I want to say like risk to reward ratio. <laughs> like what is the benefit you get from explicitly labeling yourself as a Christian artist versus the risk that comes with that? Whether, you know, it's sort of self-imposed, uh, you know, what, what somebody might call hypocrisy or self-imposed limits or something like that. You know, yeah. I think you know what I'm saying there. Um, do you got any thoughts on that? Yeah. Labels, bro. Labels. Yeah. So, so I think, you know, everything's got a label. You know, I grew up, um, not me, you know, man. <laughs> I grew up mostly listening to hip hop before I ever listened to anything else. Um, growing up in New York City, and that's pretty much, you know, what, what I did. And even then, you know, there is different labels. East Coast hip-hop, West Coast hip-hop, underground hip-hop, conscious hip-hop, gangster hip-hop. You know, everything kind of has that title so that it appeals to who you're trying to market to, which is how I, you know, truly believe the whole Christian music thing came about. You know, it was like, how do we make sure that we have a certified fan base you know no matter what we'll have somebody 
Um, and so when it comes to, you know, the hardcore scene, there's, there's tons of labels. Um, matter of fact, you know, we were a spirit filled band, but at the time I was also straight edge. So we also had the straight edge mm, label to it, edge, you know? And, yeah. and, and so, so we were a spirit filled straight edge hardcore band. And so I think what, what happens is a lot of Christians will come into, to that and then they will seek the approval um, and sometimes it doesn't really come the way that they expect or want it to. Um, and, and they kind of blame that title that they took on like, oh, well, now we need to shed this title so that we could do this or do that. Um, and, and, and they think it's you know unfair that they're held to this certain standard. But I don't think it's really true. Like if you call yourself something, you have to kind of back it up no matter what it is. Um, mm-hmm, so amen. like if there's a, you know, a vegan band and they're like, Hey, we're a vegan vegetarian, whatever band. And then you, you, <laughs> you go outside and the lead singer's like snacking on a hot dog. Like it's not unrealistic for you to be like, you're full of it. Yeah. Like you're not, you're not vegan, you know? So like, I don't know why Christians would make it to this thing where they're like, Oh, well I- I'm treated different just because I did this or, you know, well, because right. they're, they're looking at you. To, to back up what you say you are, you know, like I'm not straight edge anymore. So we get a lot of inquiries, you know, for people that are like, Hey, we would love to have you do a reunion. And I'm like, no, you know, I can't, you know, like I'm not going to get on stage, you know, and, and be part of something that I'm no longer part of, you know, like just for that sure. paycheck. So, so I think I, it's unrealistic. I find it interesting. However, that you know we talk about labels and of course labels is uh, and taxonomy in general is sort of an unavoidable and unfortunate part of being a human being um but calling an artist or an art christian is an interesting version of that because it's not so much communicating a style or a lot of times even like a content. Yeah. I mean, maybe an argument could be made for content, but, and it's, you know, it's not, uh, th- what it's doing is labeling the perspective or the belief of the artist sure. rather than sort of the the art itself. Because yeah. you listed some, you know, styles of hip hop, whether it's West Coast or East Coast, or I know nothing about hip hop, so I'm <laughs> now just <laughs> rambling. Um, Bippity bop and uh, boopy boopy cool guys. Uh, I don't think those are well. Kids bop, I guess. I guess that would fit kids under bop. a variation kids of kids bop, bop. right? Um, and it's more about it, like a geographical region attached to a style, like yeah. a certain style of uh, of art. Whereas with like a Christian. A Christian band, Christian artists, it's more of like the position of the artist rather than the expression of for the sure. music. For better, for worse, and of course, there's that's a big generalization. Um, but it's kind of similar in a way. No, I was going to say because it's like, you know, there will be some distinctions of like, oh, he's a white rapper or a black country artist or something. Yeah. Um, but you wouldn't necessarily label it that on iTunes. Yeah, so yeah. it's a little different. Yeah, and, 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 and it's less of a belief system than it is just sort of a socio uh, identity. Yeah, and, and, and it's one of those things. You know, there's a huge, you know, divide um, between you know whether or not something should be titled Christian. Like me personally, you know, like there, there's a huge thing where people within the Christian hip hop quote-unquote community um have this whole thing about like wanting to be categorized as that you know um for me personally as christian Christian hip-hop you know and they're like oh we are christian hip-hop um my whole take ever since i started doing you know christian hip-hop when i was you know like 13 was well i don't really perform for churches or anything like that like that's not really my thing why why would i take on that title when i'm trying to reach an unbeliever Um, Mm -hmm. and so me personally, like I see the title Christian so-and-so, um, a little unnecessary. Like I wouldn't call the guy who fixed my car, a Christian mechanic, Christian mechanic, or my Christian (laughs) dentist, you know? Um, but I think that it's done in a way that makes sure that you have a fan base, you know, it makes yeah. sure. Although a Christian dentist, I that would be attractive to me. I want to make sure that those <laughs> hands are sanctified before they start rooting around. Uh. Um, 
Yeah, you know, and the the more cynical side of me, which I will const depending on the day of the week, I'm oscillating back and forth all the time with this kind of attitude. But depending on how cynical I am on any given day, uh, I cannot help but feel a sort of mm, resentful conviction that a lot of times labeling an artist as a Christian artist or a band or whatever um, is like has its roots so deeply in marketing mm -hmm. that um, yeah you, I mean you ask why and the reason why is so when people see it or hear about it or share it as a Christian artist it's immediately accessible yeah. to you know a large portion of the market well yeah you you, you think like so so when when I first became a believer, you know, and, and, and I was like, all right, I, I want to get free music for free. I started like helping out at my church bookstore and you wouldn't be like, you, you would be surprised at how many times a parent didn't need to hear if something was good right. before being willing to purchase it just because it was Christian. Like, oh, well, it's Christian, so I can buy this for my child so that they don't have to listen to the worldly stuff. You know, as if like everything that doesn't have the title Christian music, you know, it is of the devil, you know. And so, yeah. so a lot of times, and I also think, as sad as this is, a lot of times something is not going to make it without that title Christian. Because if you just put it in the R&B category, they're not really as good as the other R&B artists that are out there. If you mm. put them in the, you know, punk rock category, they're not as good, you know. And so having that title Christian is a marketing, you know, tool to be able to be like, hey, we will guarantee sales because it's Christian. Right. You know, it, instant um, distribution yeah. to Christian bookstores, stuff like that. Yeah. And a lot of times and they're not even, you know, how many times have I talked to groups to find out that they weren't even Christians in the first place? Well, I was going to ask you about that because, again, while we're on the subject yeah. of like this, this uh, uh, admittedly sort of contentious conversation about this, and certainly we're not the first people to have this conversation, but I think it's worth it if for our mini series and also for the context that we're going to be talking uh, in. Uh, did you ever hear of a hardcore band, He Is Legend? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sure yes, did. bro. Everybody knew He Is Played Legend. Played with them. Now, I, you did play. Oh yeah. my gosh, that is so cool! I saw them a few times. They they were probably. I mean, I could, I could. You know, I, I'm not. I, I wouldn't dare to rank uh, my beloved Christian hardcore bands that I that <laughs> again were so <laughs> instrumental in my teenage years. Uh, but they were an interesting one yeah. because I cannot remember if they actually claimed to be a Christian band or just claimed to be Christians or whatever, mm -hmm. or if they claimed anything and somebody just told me that and I ran with it forever. Um, but their music, I thinking back right now, I could probably go back and investigate, but thinking right now, I cannot think of a single sort of Christian idea or theme mm -hmm. in, uh, within their music. Now that is barring this, the sort of broader conversation of like, well, Lots of things are Christian themes just because they don't say Jesus yeah, yeah. or use Christian words. You know, some would say that uh, a large portion of secular art is, has Christian themes, whether yeah. or not they they profess some sort of faith. Um, but I just thought it was funny because those early records, so cool. Um, and not necessarily chock-a-block full of <laughs> explicitly yeah. Christian ideas. And then, of course, later on, they, 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 I think, completely stopped even trying to uh, uphold that sort of label. Yeah. I, I, I tuned back in to His Legend a few years ago with their new, whatever their new stuff was at the time, maybe five years ago. And it's just like so explicit. Yeah. So explicit. Yeah. Like, oh, these are not the same guys. Yeah. And, and, and um, so I, I, I won't necessarily say them specifically um mm -hmm. because you know though we played with them i didn't spend a lot of time with them um but i will say there are groups now um that you can say the same thing like oh well listening to their last stuff they're not 
you know, it's not so much Christian anymore. They're not the same guys. Um, but Again, sadly, whatever that means. Yeah, but sadly, um, if you would have spent time with them, you would have known that they are the same guys. Like that, there mm. was never actually um, a, a, a Christian backing to them. You know, a, a, a lot of stories um, are kind of crazy. If you go back to like the Tooth and Nail era, um, mm -hmm. and even some of the like Face Down era, um, where bands were proclaiming the name of Christ because they knew that it was an easier sign. Um, and there were some where, you know, the, the guys from Tooth and Nail even knew that they weren't believers, but knew that they would do well, you know, at like Cornerstone and stuff like that if they had mm -hmm. that Christian title. So a yeah. lot of times it was, you know, a marketing ploy from the label to even mask things as Christian that weren't because it would drive yeah. sales. And because this is a economically motivated. Exactly. And so, mm -hmm. so yeah, so, so, so that's been unfortunately going on forever you know and that even happens in the mainstream um there there's so many times that i've heard you know from believers and unbelievers who live in certain cities like hey this guy that you know is all over mainstream christian radio this is what we know about him from living local you know and i'm just like man you know like how, how do you combat that you know um mm -hmm. so so yeah so that that's a big thing you know for me is being able to actually live what you claim. Um, and a lot of that comes from, you know, accountability, you know, for, yeah. for, you know, because even though it was happening with labels, you know, there were some actual solid believers working at these labels, you know, and so kind of like with something that happens in a church and, you know, the pastor's doing something and everybody in the church masks it, you know, like, Sure. You're part of the problem too, you know. Like you, you, you could have addressed this issue, um, and so I, I think it comes from actual believers being able to say, like, our name is on this. Let's not take it for granted. You know, while we're on the subject, um, I think it brings up a very interesting contention in my own ideas about art, because there are lots of conversations to be had about the artist and the value of the art. Mm -hmm. So when I hear you say, you know, it's important that these artists uh, practice what they preach or something like that, I agree with you. Let me start out by saying I agree with you, but I have a really finely tuned ability to, um, you know, find, to just contradict anything mm -hmm. I want to. So <laughs> just know that going in. Welcome the, to the conversation. All right, devil's advocate. <laughs> Here we go. Let's see what you got for me. Because the other side of that is, can a piece of art stand alone, stand separate from the artist? And that's number one in sort of just like a general, maybe sort of uh, philosophical sense. You know, does the art stand aside from the artist? Um, or are, or does the, the status of the artist... And you could apply status across all, you know, all taxonomies. Uh, does that change the art? Like, if uh, I don't know, what's what's like a really really famous popular Christian worship musician or something? Uh, uh, Michael W. Smith. That was, that's what I was trying to pull. Yeah. There so we go. Michael yeah, W. Michael W. Smith, famous famous worship artist, incredible. You know. Uh, 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 genre and generation defining uh, songs for the Christian person of a certain age. Uh, what if it came out that he was just like, oh yeah, no, I've actually never been Christian. I kind of think that uh, the Bible is a lie created to uh, control populations by, uh, you know, the, the ruling powers. And uh, I just thought it was like a yeah, it was just a really good marketing idea, and I made millions of dollars. Yeah. Does that then discount the value of all of Michael W. Smith's art? And if it does, does it discount the experiences that people have had with his art? People yeah. coming closer to God, or you know, experiencing um, spiritual growth in whatever way. Yeah. What is it? What do you think that relationship is like? Yeah, good question. So, two examples for me. Um, so, so years ago. Uh, I believe it was Hillsong. Um, they had a song called Healer. 
Um, yeah, and, yeah. And, and this the guy who you know wrote the song and was doing all this stuff and the story you know the song was about his story. Um, he made tons of money off of it. Winds up coming out that he was never actually sick. Um, so it was like this fake testimony to the max that oh, it was about him. Yeah, the song was about him. Yeah, like it was being about sick and being his healed sickness and, and like oh, but not even you got to mention his performance. You remember the performance, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah, don't don't leave that. Yeah, out. so he had like this performance and everything, and like it it seriously went viral. Like this song was everywhere um, about declaring, you know, how how God is the healer, you know, and it, it was well. He was he they they did this. If you didn't if you didn't know this this part, or if you're just if you're not including it, they were at one of their concerts mm-hmm. with tens of thousands yeah. of people there and he comes out like in a wheelchair on oxygen oh, yeah, yeah. oh my god and then okay, yes. like this is stands very up detail. stands yeah. up yeah. like in the middle of the song and it is an extremely powerful song i've actually had this very same conversation with somebody so i'm really interested to hear where you go with it phil yeah. but yeah i mean it was a whole charade i mean it was like it was not just like uh oh yeah god's my healer and i've been healed it was like a performance yeah. that was far beyond his own personal experience yeah. that was attached to it so yes yeah. continue so, so, so yeah, so, so that happened. It became like, you know, a, a, a very declarative song. Um, Wilds up coming out. He was never sick, never anything like that. Um, like had to confess it to like his family and everything like this, all this craziness. Um, and yes, that was an unfortunate situation. Um, what was it, the response like? Like what? Oh, well, turns you know, out, like, I mean, he full on faked being in a wheelchair and wearing an oxygen mask on stage. Yeah. And That's yeah. So, so, so obviously, you know, there's people that, you know, especially you got to think like how <laughs> fun Christians can be on like message boards and, you yeah, know, stuff like right. that and Facebook, you know, um, so, so you had, you know, the back and forth and all that stuff, but all that's just crazy drama. But at the end of the day, I have to go regardless of what happens, the Lord used that song in so many people's lives to actually yep. declare his goodness, to pray over their own healing, to believe for their own healing. And as someone who personally like has had a ton of medical stuff, um, you know, like even this past, uh, I, I just got out of a brain tumor, like tumor was behind my eye, go, th- you know, th- all that stuff. Um, mm. Had that surgery in December. And so I had a defeat doubt playlist and, you know, there was tons of songs on there that I continued to like sing over myself and be like, father, I believe help my own belief. Like I need you in this time because my heart believes, but like my flesh is weak. And, you know, there's moments where I don't want to do this because I don't know what's going to happen to my kids, this, that, and whatever. But I listened to these songs and they got me through it. Like I was able to declare Mm -hmm. the goodness of God over myself. If one of them comes out, you know, in, in, in three or four days, you know, from now and it's like, oh, we were never Christians in the first place. That doesn't change the fact that the Lord used those songs to radically change my life. So I have a friend um, that before he was actually a friend, I used to just follow his music um, at a time where, you know, hip hop was very, very cheesy within the Christian community. Uh, a group of guys named Cross Movement out of Philadelphia really were like, actual street guys making music to declare God's goodness. Um, And so a lot of his music was very formative for me as a young believer, especially as I started getting into reform doctrine and stuff like that, you know, following their journey, even when they weren't making music. Um, But recently he came out saying that he is at a point where he no longer believes and that, um, you know, in his time of going to seminary and really just, you know, studying, he can no longer justify being a Christian. Um, that does not change a single thing for me, you know, about his music or his art. Um, I still think it was done in excellence. It was done to the glory of God. It still was very formative. Um, it still doesn't make me look at him and say, oh, he was a fake artist, you know, uh, because he wasn't, you know, at the time that he was making that music, um, he was actually declaring something that he was living. Um, so I think we have to be very careful when we start, you know, taking something and saying, oh, the validity of it is no longer valid because of this. 
um, I don't think we really have the the say to be able to do that. Yeah, it's really interesting to hear you uh, talk about that, and especially to bring up that example of the Healer song, because I had uh, the same conversation with, uh, I think you know Shane Anderson. Uh, oh, we yeah, were talking yeah. about it, yeah. Um, we were talking about it, and uh, you know he's a musician, and he brought it up one time. He had actually come, I was a youth pastor at the time, and he had come to, to lead worship for us, and um, he asked him to play that song and he was like, do you know the story with that song? And I said, no, I know it's just a great song. And he told me and he's like, yeah. And I think he asked, do you still want me to play it? And I said, well, you know, I said, I mean, theologically, I mean, it is, there's nothing wrong with the content of it. Yeah. And it really doesn't matter, you know, to a certain extent about the testimony of a person's life doesn't necessarily change the message. Now in people's eyes, and, and this is something that all of us as whatever if you're involved in any kind of ministry you have any kind of influence in the world and you claim the name of jesus then your actions people are naturally going to attach those and say you claim to be this thing but you're not however the message that anybody is is preaching and teaching if that aligns with scripture if that aligns with the truth of god then it doesn't change whatsoever and that was just kind of one of those instances where i looked at that song and i said you know it's a shame that that thing was written based on a lie but what he's talking about in it is true. And if it's not true in his life, it's true in somebody else's life. And it's true. It can be true for someone else, you know, still. And, and it was just kind of one of those things where I first thought about it. And I was like, I don't really care. Like, I don't really care about the guy's story. I, I care about what's being presented here um, in this music. And I have kind of found that with a lot of musicians. There have been tons of musicians. And I, I think there's even another one, uh, Phil, that uh, uh, you would know. I'm not going to not gonna name any names. But um, they, you know, were, were a very, very popular Christian band, a very good friend of mine, um, and has since kind of, you know, yeah. stepped away from stepped away from the faith in a pretty public way. And, um, you know, you, you have to you go back and you revisit the older stuff and you're sitting there thinking. And this actually brings up kind of a deeper theological issue, which I think would be interesting. You could weigh in on that, too, is it's like, you know, were these people ever actually mm -hmm. believers? And in some yeah. instances you have said that you've had people that have, you know, just kind of claimed the title in order to kind of get the sales that that might go along with it. I didn't realize there was such a market, but um, I guess that there is and whatever <laughs> you get, whatever you can, whatever slice of whatever pie you can get. Get. So it doesn't seem, you know, too absurd, but you certainly have people that will just take that angle. But then you have other people who you look at and you say, no, I like I knew these people like yeah. I knew this man. I heard his testimony. I did life with him. I knew him. He was a believer, if not still is. And then now there's this other sort of thing that's that's being, you know, presented to the world. And then I wonder, not just on on the basis of their art, on what they're giving to the world, their music and things like that, but also like kind of the discussion. And I know how I feel about it, but about their salvation were they ever actually really <laughs> christians and this is one of those things too that kind of gets tied into this whole you know discussion with art but i don't have a whole lot of sympathy for artists when you start getting questions and you start getting judged because that is you're putting yourself out there you're sharing it, it's very brave it's a very bold thing to do you take something that you've created and you put it out there for public consumption yeah. and along with that is going to come critique along with that is going to come people's judgment it's going to come their their positive positive accolades and their negative ones and it kind of reminds me of the thing uh I think Lecrae was the one who coined it. If you live for people's acceptance, then you die by their rejection, right? Mm -hmm. If you're out yep. there wanting, if, if people's acclaim is the thing that fuels you, then when they start to criticize you, then it will crush you. And it's just kind of like, I think, you know, for artists, it's like, I mean, this is what this is what it's all about. I was just listening to this thing about Van Gogh. I'm going to hand it over to you on the question that I'm way past now. But Van Gogh, in, during his entire life, he never sold a single painting. I think he sold one painting, you know, while he was alive. Alive, and then it was after he died, you know, that now you can't even you you couldn't purchase a Van Gogh for less than a hundred million dollars, you know, yeah. an original. Um, and his whole life, you know, was basically just spent with people criticizing him. But he's this incredibly, you know, now we recognize him as a brilliant artist, and it's kind of that struggle. But to a certain extent, um, I was listening to you guys talk, and I was just like, yeah, I don't really. I mean, I don't really suck it up, Buttercup. I mean, this is the this is the venue that you have entered into. And you're opening yourself up to criticism. So two things. Let me have you respond to one. If the people present themselves as Christians uh, and then later on kind of defect from that, 
are they actually, and then you can take that out of the realm of art and into the actual Christian world of a person's professing, and then they denounce. I'm curious to hear what you would say about that. And then tell me if I'm being too hard on artists uh, in saying you should just like judgment is part of the part of the gig. Yeah, man. So, so it's hard um, because honestly, I don't think I'll ever know the actual answer um, to the first question until, Mm -hmm. until I'm with the Lord, you know? Um, and and it's hard because, you know, I, I've been raised so many different ways, like based off of like the community of faith that I've been part of, um, throughout the years. Um, but it's hard because up until recently with this whole, you know, fanatic of cross movement thing, like this guy knew his word, this guy, surrendered probably the last like 20 years of his life to you know touring professing growing in the faith creating um you know material for you know people in the urban community to come into a reformed you know understanding of the gospel um and so to now hear him say you know like if there was a salvation, like, yeah, of of course I believed it, but now I don't, um, kind of makes me go, man, what, where did things happen there? Um, like my, my previous, you know, mindset would have been like, we know them based off their fruit, you know? So if there is no fruit anymore, you know, maybe they weren't really saved. Maybe they understood Mm -hmm. a portion of, you know, who Jesus was, but never really fully surrendered. Kind of like, you know, having that um, conversation of like, I do all these things, Lord, you know, what do I have to do to follow you? You know, and him saying, you have to, you know, sell everything you have and and, and follow me, you know, like maybe at this point, that was the too much that he couldn't surrender, you know? Um, So, so it's hard because like, there is that very big, like, there's so much scripture that just talks about like we will know you know who his people are and people will say like i knew you and he'll say depart from me you never knew me like you did Mm -hmm. all these things in my name so so i still lean more so more towards they didn't really like understand what they were buying into um because especially in western christianity like there's not really much that we give up when we accept it you know um i I don't remember what i was listening to the other day um but i was you know just thinking of the amount of sacrifice that in the book of acts when someone said i am a believer oh it was actually in church the other day he was talking about baptism and if it needs to happen immediately and he was talking about like people see that in scripture, but they don't realize the context of like, people are getting stoned left and right, you know? So Mm -hmm. when they got saved, they were like, Hey, I'm probably going to die really soon. Anyway, like, let's get this baptism going right now. They knew what was at hand. They knew what they were really like buying into. Um, so I think a lot of times, you know, especially with a lot of these bands that I see leave, you know, they buy into something real quick, especially when they're younger, you know, it's like, Hey, we're in youth group and we're starting this band, you know, like, Mm -hmm. and we all accepted Jesus, you know, or grew up in the church. And now we're touring all over the place without any accountability, any discipleship, you know, and now we're not anymore, you know? Um, so, so I still kind of hold true to the, you know, maybe they just never really knew him. Um, but I also am not prideful enough to say that I know that for certain. Um, and then it's really good. And then, you know, again, goes back to the conversation we were just having, which is, okay, all that being expressed, does that change the art that they made at the time? Or does it change um, really anything about what their uh, creativity, uh, what effect yeah. that had on the community or the world as a whole? Um, yeah, not which, at all. And, yeah. and, and that's the thing is that let's even switch it the other way all right so like when 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 i was getting into you know certain artists like n-e-r-d and pharrell uh before pharrell was like poppy fun pharrell um and the group that he managed the clips 
a lot of their music really like shaped, you know, some of what I was wanting to do stylistically and approach wise. Um, because what I loved about them was like, they were unashamed of their story. It wasn't a Christian story in any way, shape or form, but I loved the fact that they were like really true to who they were. No sugarcoating, no nothing. Years later, this guy gets saved from that group. That doesn't taint the music and the effect it had on me either, you know? So why should it be the other way? Especially when it's, if I really believe that the gospel does not come back void, it really shouldn't matter where that truth came from. Because Mm. ultimately, like Chris said, it's gospel, you know? So the truth came from proclaiming the word, which I find infallible, regardless of the person who was fallible. There That's you go. good, man. That's right. good. I love what it. was your other question, Chris? <laughs> the other one remember. was was should artists it. just suck it up? All this they're getting categorized. Well, I don't think genres. anybody's People trying are... to say that you shouldn't, you know, have an opinion about <laughs> about all this. Well, you know, you yeah, do put no, yourself so... out there. You're sort of uh, volunteering to have people form yeah. opinions about you. And, yeah, and, and, I, I don't even necessarily think. The art, like, so, so this is the thing. The closer you get to these artists, you realize that a lot of their battle with like categories and titles and stuff like that um, are not so much the categories and titles, but the unrealistic expectations mm-hmm. that Christians put on them. You know, like, if you look at like, the, the, the biggest downfall of, like, Lecrae's career, you know, he started doubting things because he was like, dealing with some things and instead of the church being like hey we've been reaping off of your ministry for the last however many years like how can we be a support to you now it was oh are you really legit are you this are you that and that kind of deconstruction of his character kind of started pushing him to a deconstruction of do i really want to be part of this you know so so i don't think it's like a form of uh, purity culture you know art do you pass the purity test and if you do, then great. You can continue your you know, position in culture. But if you don't pass the purity test, uh, then you, know, you are stripped of your honors and are yeah. cast into yeah. the outer darkness. Well, the thing that's so funny about that, too, though, is that you can think of all of these, you know, like I remember when all of the Christians were wanting to cancel POD because they went on mm-hmm. tour with... They were like at Ozfest or something yeah. like that, and they were playing with Ozzy and Marilyn Manson and stuff. And people were like, "This is ridiculous!" And you know, they, they find something to complain about. But if you are familiar with, you know, uh, the story in life of Rich Mullins, uh, there's actually a movie that was that somebody made about him. It's called Ragamuffin, um, and Rich Mullins wrote tons of classic. Uh, Christian songs from like the, I guess the late eighties, early nineties, uh, our God is an awesome God, whatever it Mm -hmm. is. Awesome God being chief among them. Um, in the entire time, I believe the way they paint it in that movie is he's sitting there with a bottle of bourbon in one of his hands drunk and he's composing our God is an awesome God while he's like struggling through alcoholism and he's, you know, offering these contributions to the world and people have no idea about the struggles that he's actually going through. And then there again, we come back to the, like the theology of the song. And that's not even like they, now they, they were this thing, they were a professing Christian and now they've kind of turned away from that. Should we still listen to this song? How about, should we still be playing this song when the guy who was writing it was drunk, like (laughs) basically the entire time? Do you think that, like, do you think that's acceptable? And of course people don't, you know, most people don't know that story about Rich Mullen's life, but it, it's just so funny that, you know, the things like, like Basil was talking about these kind of purity tests and those sorts of things it's like people have to you know measure up to this sort of litmus test and then really of course you take that little microscope you're looking at other people with and turn it around on yourself and none of us is going to pass that test right. um i yeah. mean that's the whole that's the whole point of the yeah. gospel um Which so goes yeah in, i yeah i do think that you know yes artists christian artists whatever however you want to call it uh <laughs> should be given much more grace i think than the church uh generally gives them but then also that doesn't uh, there's sound a certain like amount the of church nowadays chris what an unrealistic <laughs> expectation to put on the church modern american yeah. evangelical church um okay but that, that mm. here's here's one thing i'll say on mm-hmm. that chris yeah so 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 there's a lyric that i absolutely love um 
that Andy Mineo recently came out with. Oh, um, Andy, love and, him. Yes, and it says, before you hold a grudge, you should hold a beer. Before you hold a stone, you should hold a mirror. And mm. I think about all the people that could look down on the Rich Mullins or this person or that person. And, like, yes, there were struggles and stuff like that there. But think about everything else that we struggle with on a daily basis. Like, I could have a very rough season, you know, like, does that void, you know, the fact that I was a father for that part of my life because I struggled with this or with that? Like, no, anything I put my hands to, regardless of whether it's in a strong season or, you know, a downfall season, like, that shouldn't be what we define everything else of the character of the person. Like, yeah. if we yeah. just look at, you know, the scripture and we just want to take a verse out of context and say, oh my gosh, David was a peeping Tom. Like, nothing about the Psalms is something that we should be singing or declaring <laughs> over our lives. Yeah. Like, no, yeah. he was a creep in those verses, but he also then became a man after God's own heart. Like, the yeah. only person in scripture that was given that title, you know? Yeah. So... So, so I think we have to be very careful on how you know, easy it is for us to judge somebody without realizing that our own lives are full of like, a ton of crap that on paper it, it is not the most you know, luxurious thing to look at. Yeah, which yeah. is fun, especially in just sort of the world as a whole right now and cancel culture and all this type of thing. You know, uh, you, somebody digs up a, a bad quote or something from 10 years ago and the yep. attempt is to just completely erase you from the map and discount all the work you've done since. Yep. Um, and you know, as I like to point out the American evangelical church was sort of the original, uh, the cancel culture. We've, we've been doing that forever. And it just seems yeah. like, uh, you know, as much as, uh, the church tries to influence culture, culture, uh, kind of grabbed on to maybe not the best part of uh, our recent history. Now, yeah. I want to take some time and talk about your some of your work, okay? Yeah, yeah we didn't get past, uh, we interrupted him at Spirit-Filled Hardcore, and here we are still, so. <laughs> wow, well, you know, that's podcasting for you. Um, so, one of the things that you do is you curate uh, gospel and the arts. Correct. Dot com. And yep. there's an Instagram. Go yep. follow it, people. Got gospel and the arts. And, you know, I was going to, I wanted to get into sort of um, a conversation about art and economics and artists and things like that. Because there's a, a real twisty, turvy relationship that artists have with um, money and financial things yep. and economics. And um, both culture relies on art and artists rely on economics, uh, at, at least if they want to sort of uh, make it some kind of profession. And yet sometimes those two things, there's a mismatch. And, you know, how do you value art outside of some sort of free market and et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we can get into that. But I want to start out by reading just a, a bit from uh, the about page on Gospel and the Arts. Um, and then I'd love to hear more about it and kind of what the, what you got going on there. Um, so it goes like this gospel and the arts has two main purposes. First to educate the local church on the importance of the arts and why it is important that they are supporting artists within their churches and community. I think, and community is a very interesting uh, aspect to that. Secondly, to encourage and disciple artists on what it means to be successful in their calling, both financially and most of all spiritually. Our goal is to work in excellence and allow our creations to draw attention to our creator. Gospel and the Arts is here to educate, encourage, challenge, network, and renew. Yeah. Tell me about that. Yeah, so one thing that I realized most in my time doing music full-time was that a lot of compromise started happening in my own life um being out on the road traveling gaining recognition out there um and realizing that i was gaining so much recognition and support from outside 
my local church Mm -hmm. um and not much from within oh yeah um so so as i started pulling back and like seeing where things started to like go wrong with me and music and ministry and it was like man i was so strong you know when, when, when i first went out there now i feel like there's compromise in my heart and in my life and i realized it was because of my lack of actual accountability and, and, and like relationships from within the church and what i realized was i'm in this hardcore band and my mega church at the time you know or like that i grew up in and then the ministries that i was then a part of later didn't really understand the scene that i was a part of so i feel like a lot of a lot of times in the churches okay we don't understand so we can't support instead of we don't understand let us educate and see if this is something that we need to get behind um and so I lost a lot of the relationships that I had there. And so I felt like, okay, I can do this just me and Jesus, you know? And then it was like, okay, I really can't, you know, there's a reason yeah. we're called to community and accountability and so forth. And so, so that's the first part of like the second part of what we do in the ministry is we really want to be a place where artists can feel like they can reach out and have somebody that understands what they're going through, uh, encourages them, supports them. Um, and, and that they can, you know, grow spiritually. And also, like you were saying, financially, it's so hard when, when you don't have, you know, any support to, to, to make it about the money when you got bills and stuff to pay. Um, and so, so, so that's one thing is I want to help artists spiritually and financially learn how to do what they feel like the Lord's called them to do. Um, the first part is I could get bitter at the local church and be like, Hey, you guys did not support me, you know, I don't want anything to do with this kind of community, this, that, whatever. We see that all the time. Um, But what I want to do is educate local churches to see how important it is to be that resource for their church. Like so many times I see all the craziest things, you know, have, if you want to give towards this, and I'm like, we really give towards these things? Like, (laughs) yet alone, like, an artist that has been part of your church for the last 10 years is now saying, hey, the Lord is calling me to do this full time. I don't know how I'm going to financially survive, but I'm going to trust the Lord. And you go, awesome, we'll be praying for you. Really? Mm. Like, you can't pass a bucket one time a month to make sure that that artist who led your worship team for the last eight years makes sure that his family's still eating? Like, I, so, so I want to make sure that the church understands the need to support and, and why partnering with these artists is so important. You know, if they were important when they were within your four walls, now when they're on the road, they should be just as important, if not more. Yeah. You should be checking in on them. You should be praying for them. You should be making sure that they're eating, making sure that if their van has broken down, that you guys raise some support for them, you know, that you're constantly interceding for them. Um, and, and so that's what I want to see from the local church. And I feel like, you know, we as artists need to not be bitter with the church, but come alongside the church and be like, Hey, let me, un- let me help you understand. And you said, you know, the community part, uh, was the interesting part. Um, and, and that's where I'm like, man, that shouldn't be the interesting part. You know, like what, one thing that I've really, really loved is, um, the book art for God's sake, um, where it talks about like art, if it's something beautiful, like obviously, unless it's like intended to purposely like defame the Lord. Um, but if it's beautiful, it has beauty because it resembles God in some way, shape or form. Um, and so, so we, I feel as the church should not just be looking for opportunities to go and support Christian artists, but artists in general. Like, we should really love our community to a point where, like, we're going out there and enjoying the art that's created and being a light. Like, so many times I see where people are like, Hey, let's do everything within the church walls. Let's Christianize everything. We're going to have a Christian dance off. We're going to have a Christian, you know, painting, Christian poetry night. Well, that's great. But if you're declaring your testimony to a bunch of believers, like who's actually hearing the gospel for the first time? 
unless someone brought someone in. So to support the artists that are in your church to be like, yes, your testimony through this spoken word is beautiful and you're performing at this non-Christian club next week and we're going to be there to support you. Mm -hmm. Like it's easy to say, hey, we support what you're doing. Great job when they do the poem before a sermon on a Sunday morning. Right. But if you've never actually gotten out of your house to go on a Friday night to support that artist when they're performing not within a church wall, then I can't really say you support them. Like so so challenging church leadership, church members to actually be what they say when they support and going out and being there for the artist so that when the artist looks out, they see actual people who they say are doing life with them. They're saying, hey, we're here with you. We're praying with you. You got this. Yeah. You know, there's an interesting aspect of that. And of course, support can come in all different ways. But just to touch on the economic side, um, you know, the church, at least many of the churches that I've been to, been in, visited, these types of things, um, they may boast about, and it may not be explicitly boasting, but, you know, the church in general sort of boasts this disconnection from the sort of worldly economic system, you know, that the kingdom sort of economics, the, the caring for one another, the supporting one another, the, uh, you know, to passing the bucket, like you said, the, the communal aspect um, that is sort of modeled in the early church. And then as much as is comfortable, which is often not very, very comfortable at all, uh, modeled, you know, in, in modern American churches. And to a degree that is the case, again, like you say, as long as it's inside the four walls, like mm -hmm. as you uh, come and read a poem or perform a song or do something in the church during a service, they, they can pass the bucket and say, we want to support uh, our dear artist here who's it wasn't that great everybody yeah isn't the lord working <laughs> through this young lady young man yeah okay well we're gonna uh, take a love offering for them and support them and we just love seeing what god is doing through them yeah but then the second that the art is outside of the context of the four walls of the church suddenly and this may just be an american phenomenon you know the free market kicks back in baby you're not you're you're not inside the four walls you are out you gotta work for it if your if your art is good enough the market will provide my son good luck we will be praying for you or whatever um and yeah rarely does that you know for instance like with missionaries you know there's sort of the church um structure economic structure where a missionary will be sponsored by a church and they can go off and do their missionary work and, and you know be relatively confident that a church will uphold their commitment to supporting them on a monthly basis uh and it's you know that's one example of where when the work gets taken outside of the church the church is there to keep it going now of course it's you know under under certain uh requisites prerequisites uh, but those same kind of prerequisites can be put on an artist who mm -hmm. grows up in a church, is supported by the church, the church's, um, you know, the, the sort of fostering of that skill and that talent and that interest. This is how, oh my gosh, countless, countless amounts of, uh, you know, young teenagers uh, lead worship in a church and, you know, go off and try to become professional musicians sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't work and it's because of that those economic forces the american church at least we are still americans baby the free market will prevail and uh you know once you're once you're out on your own we're we, we hope to see you succeed but that is not a guarantee and if you don't it is not our fault yeah and, and that that's the hard part for me is like you know, through the years seeing, you know, like I totally believe in missions, done tons of mission trips, you know, I support it. However, it's so easy to support even sometimes missionaries that you don't know, you know, you're getting mm -hmm. behind an organization. Yet, like you said, the kid who's 
led worship with you since he was 14 years old and now is feeling called to hit the road at 22, yet that can't be done in the same way where you raise funds for that artist on a monthly basis mm. when you know his character, you know where his tithe has gone since he was, you know, old enough to work at 16 years old. You know, that that's the hard thing for me is like, what, what do we consider, you know, ministry? You know, like, is it does it have to be overseas? Does it have to be digging wells? You know, is that the only way that that's ministry? Like, it, it, is the kid that's, you know, going out to places that he's, most likely, you know, going to face a lot of ridicule for representing Christ the way he does, but it's what he feels called to, and he's playing these venues on Friday nights. Is that not ministry? Can we not get behind that? Can we not, like, make sure that his family, who he's been married for, like, four years, that they have food, you know? So so that's the hard thing for me is, like, drawing that line of why is, you know— why can we support the artist when it's within the four walls and not as much when they feel called outside, even though our call is to go out and make disciples, not this stay would be, in? This would be my, my kind of question to it, and I, and I agree with what you're saying. I support it, but I'm wondering if no, you doesn't. don't put some kind He's of uh, <laughs> if you don't put some kind of qualification on that because it's interesting as I've been thinking about the whole conversation and we're talking about like labeling artists right and like yeah. you're a what a christian artist but then we were like well we, you don't call it a christian dentist you yeah. know so then I'm thinking about you know like uh, a dentist and I mean immediately you're thinking well a dentist you know he's already he's already making you know his own his own money probably a pretty good career uh as a dentist but uh perhaps another trade or something like that that wouldn't be art but where a person is going out and they're and they're working a trade that's let's say is not necessarily specifically gospel centered and i think that's generally as i'm thinking about it where the church is going to say well of course i'll give money to a missionary he's devoted his whole life to to spreading and communicating the gospel and then i'm wondering if you don't put a qualification on the type of support that you would like to see from the church based on the actual uh, product that the artist is producing and then do we have at that point if if as you know in a church and me as a as a new pastor you know we decide to support some kind of artist do we then have uh you know a responsibility even some kind of mandate to say if we're supporting you in this then your work should be reflecting something that is gospel centric or do we just kind of let them no just go be a like a christian dentist except you're a christian you know singer so is do you do you think that if if we're calling for the church to financially support artists that their their art should be explicitly christian and explicitly you know gospel centered and evangelistic yeah and and yeah i definitely think there has to be you know criteria you know and 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 accountability you know um to 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 what a church is backing i think the major difference between a lot of um professions and being an artist so to speak especially in, in, in something that is um with the use of actual lyrical content is the platforms that you are given, you know, like when, when, when you're a plumber, you know, you're really not <laughs> having a ton of opportunities to present the gospel. Um, mm-hmm. you know, may, maybe an opportunity happens here or there, but a lot of times you get the door opened, you're pointed to where the toilet's at, and then you're pointed to where the door is at once you're done fixing, you know, the toilet. Um, sure. as opposed to when you're, let's say in a band or something like that, you're getting booked, you're presenting your lyrical content, you're speaking in between each one of your songs. So do I think that there needs to be a, oh, you, you need to have an altar call at each and every like concert? I'm like, no, like that's sure. not it, you know? Yeah. But there has to be fruit, you know? So like if, if you would have came to one of our old shows, so the other day it was crazy. I was, uh, I was at... Um, a Disney hotel with my family, and we were just kind of like relaxing, you know. Bro, I had, you're a Disney fiend, bro. I love Disney, bro. <laughs> Straight up. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so I'm at this Disney resort with a friend, and we're waiting on our coffee. And I was like, man, it's seriously packed for a Thursday. Um, and so I'm looking out, and I see someone that I haven't seen since like 
forever, my band days. Um, and he was in a band called Four Today. And he was Four the vocalist. Today? Four I didn't Today? I knew Four Today. Oh, Bro, yeah. Matt, gotta, Matty's my boy. I got to tell my brother, he's he was huge into Four Today. Yeah, that. so so I see Matty, and I hadn't seen Matty in years. Like, we did ministry together. We performed festivals together. Um, but then I moved, he moved, we stopped being in the bands. So I went out, saw him, gave him a big hug. And one of his first questions, because so many people have walked away from uh, the faith, from our time doing music, he was like, you still following Jesus? I was like, you know it, man. And so we continued to talk. But thinking of Maddie, after every, every show, whether he declared it massively or whatever, he always was like, listen, I believe in prayer. I'm here. If you want prayer, I'll be at the back by the merch table. Like, I'm here. And wasn't yeah. pushy, wasn't this, wasn't that. But we had so many opportunities in dark clubs filled with a band who right before, you know, had songs about how Jesus was a lie and were in the back of these places laying hands on people, you know? like, mm -hmm. And so being able to, like, see fruit from that kind of art I don't think is really hard, you know? So for a church to be able to be like, hey, we're going to be keeping up with you, finding out how you're doing on the road. We want to keep you accountable when we feel like it gets to a point where you're not really allowing us to be the church in your life anymore and being the elders over like your personal life as well, then we really can't financially pour into what you're doing, you know, which would be the same with like any missionary that I support, you know, like I, I have some friends that we, we support, you know, and they constantly are sending us newsletters, photos, videos, testimonies. We have people that have gone out and spent time with them. If I got, you know, a call from one of the people that went out there and was like, yo, Phil, nothing that like is supposed to be happening is really happening. I wouldn't be able to justify writing that next check, you know, like yeah. there is that accountability of like, hey, you say you're doing this. I need to see that to continue to support you. We will back you as long as you are really doing the call of the Lord over your life and we're seeing that fruit, you know? So, yeah. so, so I think that definitely there should be um, a, a standard that they're held to because they're proclaiming, you know, to be doing this for the Lord as opposed to I'm doing this just because this is what I'm good at. Yeah. I want to bring this uh, like a little a little more personal for you now and kind of get into some of your current work, too, because, um, I mean, you were talking about like you used a plumber as an example, you know, and yeah. and how that's a little bit harder platform to kind of, you know, be uh, even evangelistic, you know, in what yeah. you're doing. But you currently and we haven't even I don't think gotten to this part, not in the conversation, maybe in the introduction, but you are yeah. a photographer, uh, yeah. quite accomplished photographer, too. Um, and if you folks have not check out his not only gospel and the arts, but also Phil's personal page, um, you do basically wedding photography is your specialization. And um, man, you take some of the some of the best wedding photos I've ever seen, man. They are truly Thank you, man. they are truly pieces of art each one of them um and that is that is kind of your bread and butter right now as i understand yeah. it unless you have some other some other <laughs> thing going on right now but i mean you're getting i mean you get calls all over the country to yeah. go out and do work um so quite accomplished but i'm wondering as that is so you're an artist right as, as a photographer and then i'm kind of wondering how do you I guess two kind of questions. How does your how does your theology and how does your relationship with the Lord affect your photography? What you actually do as a discipline? Because each and every one of us, I believe, no matter what our what our you know area of specialization is, it should be uh, kind of filtered through the lens of the gospel. You know, everything yeah. that we do, we should be doing as unto the Lord. So, one, how does your photography kind of uh, how is it filtered through the lens of the gospel? And then two. How do you find um, your work and your, you know, engagements with your with your clients and things like that to be opportunities for evangelism? Also, yeah. feel free. I know Chris thinks that he's uh, giving you an open ended question here, but he did <laughs> just tell you that if you are are not using your uh, your vocation as a uh, evangelism opportunity then you are uh, you're in trouble. So <laughs> it's totally okay to not have. Yeah. Did I say the, that? 
<laughs> no, no, he's just giving you a hard time. Just messing with you, but you know, I mean, I mean, I, I guess po- what's triggered in me there is I wonder if there is, you know, because uh, photography is one thing, but if there's somebody out there in the world, uh, perhaps flipping burgers or something, to hear that, you know, the, they might be wondering how their gospel. Um, message is being played out in their burger flipping well so yeah I mean, maybe in that context i'd be interested yeah. to, to hear what you have to say <laughs> yeah. everything you do you do it to the glory of god yes it is a question for all of Boom. us to consider <laughs> i'm certainly wondering what uh yes yes phil how do you do it how do yeah you do yeah it? so 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 yeah i have two businesses that i run one specifically for weddings one you know for more commercial um photography and video um and, and, and that was pretty much my answer, you know, it's a Christian answer, um, but it's also the truth, you know, so I, I truly believe whether I eat, sleep, drink, or whatever I do, that I need to do it to the glory of God. Um, and so how that looks for me personally is in, in a business that can be very, very transactional, where it's, hey, I'm available for your date, send me your money. Um, I remember a while ago, there was a photographer um, who... I won't name his name, but he was huge in, in the wedding industry, like huge. Um, and his business actually had a Christianese name to it because uh, he grew up in the faith. Um, yet I went to one of his workshops, and one of the things he said was, I never you know, talk to my couples until they pay me, and then once they pay me, like, we have a quick introduction and then I don't talk to them again until the wedding day. And I was just like, man, that is so like, Hey, yeah, you're, 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 you're seeing these people as like a mere dollar sign. Like yet you're capturing one of the most important days of their lives. Like that's super the opposite of anything I'll ever do. Um, and so since that kind of day, you know, my whole approach to it is, I build relationships with these people. Like I get to know them. I love them with the heart of Christ, whether they're believers, whether they're not, you know, like I'm there to serve them with the heart of Christ. And a lot of my, you know, uh, couples and and clients, they actually follow my personal, personal life. Um, And so even within, you know, my Instagram, which is a majority of like, you know, photos and stuff like that, you know, I'm open and honest about what the Lord's doing in my life, what I'm challenged with, you know, like even with this time with the surgery, like it was crazy to see how many people, you know, from that I've worked with or that follow my photography that reached out the day before the surgery saying, Hey, you know, your, your faith has really like restored mine. I walked away from the Lord because of some like hard stuff that I went through through the years, but it was nothing compared to what you're currently going through and you're still blatantly serving Jesus and it really convicted me. And, you know, I'm making sure that like I seek the Lord and come back to the Lord, you know, those kind of things just kind of happen from being open, being honest and making the Lord, the Lord of everything that you do. Um, so I back it by actually treating my couples with the heart of Christ, because if they follow me and all they see is that this guy proclaims to love Jesus, yet I've truly made it all about money and I've truly neglected them or have had no compassion for them or empathy for them, then like the Bible says, like, then I'm like a resounding, like noisy gong, you know, like Mm -hmm. it's pointless. Um, but they've seen that. And so they've allowed me to like speak into their lives. They've allowed me to love on them. You know, I remember I was at a wedding of this guy who (coughs) told me that he had, you know, been saved, but he struggled with some stuff, you know, had some PTSD from like when he served in the military and stuff like that. Um, but that he really wanted his life to, to glorify God. Um, as he continued to, to learn more about God and we were at his wedding and, um, something happened. He had a, you know, hard relationship with his brother and, but his parents were like, no, like you cannot not have your brother in your bridal party. Like this is something that we always said was going to be the case. So he put his brother into the bridal party. Things started going a little crazy on the day, running behind. They couldn't find the brother anywhere for the things that he needed to be a part of. 
and you can just see this groom get livid. Like, that PTSD, old military him started to show up, and he was livid. The brother showed up. He's, like, yelling, screaming, cursing at him, like, ready to fight because he's so upset. And I just felt like the Lord was like, pull him aside and ask him if you could pray. So called his name, asked him if I could talk to him real quick. He came over. It was steaming. He's like, what's up? And I was like, I think we need to pray. Like, you cool with me praying over you? And he's like, yeah, we prayed. And all of a sudden there was peace over him. And so being willing to like allow those moments where the Lord tells you, hey, you're going to use this opportunity for my glory. You're going to reflect me. You have to be willing to do that. Um, so, so is it the same as like every time I shoot a wedding, like, Hey, I'm here. I got my Bible and my camera, like, <laughs> you know, like I'm gonna take a photo and then we're going to recite, you know, the book of first John in its entirety together. Like, no, you know, I don't, you should don't try ha- that once though. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. <laughs> The belligerent bridal party would love that. Uh, but but the, the couples, you know, allow that stuff. You know, like when they follow my life, you know, they, they allow me to like have that kind of relationship with them. And so I feel like that's how it is, whether they're believers or not. I don't care what people think. Like, oh, Phil's shooting this wedding and it looked like this kind of party. Yeah, it was. You know, I was hanging out with tax collectors, but I also, you know, in their thing where it talked about like, hey, Phil, would you sign my guest book? I did. And I left scripture there because I want them to know where that love is coming from, you know? Yeah. yeah. So so just using every opportunity I can to, to reflect the heart of the father. Yeah. And then what about your medium? Like, do you find, and I don't, I'm, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to put you, put you in a, in a weird spot or whatever, but yeah, yeah. is there a way that you like actually take your photos? I think that was a great uh, answer for the, for the evangelistic side, but is there a way that you actually like, as you're doing your work and even taking the pictures, editing them afterwards and those sorts of things that you're kind of finding that to be worshipful or anything like that? Is there, can you kind of explain your perspective, um, you know, on that, is yeah. there anything there? You got to yeah. be thinking about the Lord in the midst of that, right? Yeah. And, and so, so, so there's a lot, man, you know, like, um, there's a lot of times where, you know, scripture is used maybe at a wedding where, you know, the lives of the people aren't really, um, <clears throat> you know, living that, you know, like they'll pull out first Corinthians, you know, and they'll, the, 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 the pastor love, that they yeah. hired or yeah. this, that, or whatever, you know, or, or, they, they grew up like that, so the parents are, like, giving a speech or a toast about, you know, the Lord's going to move in your life, you know, and you might know that there's really no, you know, fruit there right now, you know. It's allowed me to have opportunities where I'm actually in prayer while I'm taking those photos. Like, Lord, let this actually be something that defines their marriage. Let them come to a point where it's not just something that is declared at their wedding, but it's something that they're able to declare in their lives, you know? Um, and, and so stuff like that, you know, gives me the opportunity to, while I'm shooting, actually be able to feel the presence of the Lord or be in the presence of the Lord while I'm doing that. Um, and then when it comes to like, you know, taking the photos and stuff like that, you know, like I feel like every time I'm shooting, it has to be, and this is what I tell people that I'm mentoring all the time, like, there is no time where it's no longer important, you know, like, it's not, oh, I took the photos of the ceremony, I took the posed portraits, and now I kind of, like, do this when I want to do, like, each moment is important to this couple, so it's got to be important to me. So I have to have the heart of the Father in that. And so when I'm taking these photos, and I'm, you know, editing these photos, I'm not trying to just get done with it. I'm trying to actually use it as worship because the Lord's given me these gifts and talents and the initial getting to know the couple, the actual wedding day when I'm photographing and the end product are all like declarations of me doing things in excellence to love with the heart of the father. So I'm going to use those moments to actually press into the father while I'm doing it. Um, and, and so, so that's pretty much how I approach, you know, wedding photography, um, is, you know, like, and, and I'll be honest, there's times I don't really want to do it, you know, like so, something's happening and it's a Saturday afternoon 
and my family's doing these events. And of course, I can't be part of it because I'm shooting. It's mm -hmm. a Saturday. That's what I do. Um, so I have to go into it saying, all right, Lord, let your will be done here. <laughs> let your heart for these people come through. Like cha change my heart of wanting to be somewhere else and remind me of you know, the importance of loving them through this and being an example and, and, and doing this unto you as worship. Very nice. Love it. Yeah, I love it. You know, you've got a great, um, you've got a great quote on here from Philip Graham Riken to be an artist is often to be misunderstood. And I think mm -hmm. those who spend, well, uh, Look, I'm still, it's still up in the air whether podcasting is an art or not, but it's the one thing <laughs> that I think I can qualify as some sort of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, length of time doing one thing that I can really be proud of. You're something of a musician, Basil. Don't, yeah. uh, don't short yourself I, there. I, you I am now, yes. I've done, I've done all sorts of, uh, well, I've done all sorts of art all over the, all over the place. Um, but you know, specifically with podcasting, I'm very often sort of obsessed with this idea of, am I being misunderstood? Is there a way that this could be misinterpreted? And very, very often, no matter how much attention I put into thinking, ah, this is, they'll get this. Surely nobody could misunderstand this. Uh, it's almost inevitable. And I know that that is sort of a chronic condition of the artist and um that's it what do you have to say for yourself bill all right rephrase the question no, there is no question <laughs> there is no question it's an open-ended i make a comment to be an artist is often to be misunderstood yeah. and it's yeah. uh, it seems to be sort of a perennial um occupation of the artist which is yeah. <laughs> to try to communicate to try yeah. to um, be understood and to yeah. ultimately failing at that over and over and over, perhaps not because of the failing of the art or the artist, but it is just sort of the condition of two humans, um, you know, yeah. being communicated to. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so I think there's two parts, you know, um, first, whether you're a believer or not, you know, there, there's, there's a reason there's that whole notion of starving artist, you know, um, because it's one of those things where it's such a hard thing to make that a career that even when you're not a believer, <laughs> you know, people are like, why are you choosing that lifestyle? Um, and so I think in one sense, that is where a lot of like an artist is misunderstood. Like, why would you choose that lifestyle? Um, and for me personally, the answer to that is I have tried <laughs> and tried with everything within me to choose a different lifestyle, but it's so who I am that I always come back to it. You know, it, it's one of those like gifts and a curse, you know, at the same time. Um, so I think that that's the first of the misunderstanding is like, why would you choose to be an artist when you could be a doctor or be a dentist or be this or that? Like there's something within us as artists that we just don't feel truly fulfilled unless we're doing that. And, and I truly feel like that's kind of part of our making, you know, from the father. Mm. Um, it, it is, you know, you, you look at, you know, scripture and it shows, you know, certain people were given, you know, certain artistic roles when building, you know, that, that temple, you know, like it wasn't, Hey, whoever wants to do this, it was like, no, I've given this person, this gift and this person, this gift, you know? Mm. And, and so I feel like for me personally, like I've tried to this, I've tried to that. Matter of fact, one of my funniest stories was like, you know, in college, um, uh, or, Maybe it was in high school. I think it was in high school. In high school, I was like, okay, I, I love the arts, but I got to actually think of like my future. You know, what, what am I really going to do? Um, and so my mom worked at a law firm and she had a really good, you know, connection with this lady who had, um, who, who worked at uh, some like medical filing center, like medical field, whatever. 
Um, so they got me the job at, at, as like this guy who was going to go in and work in their filing system. All right. And so here I am, you know, 17 years old, wanting to be an artist, but feeling like, nope, can't waste my life. I got to do something real. Uh, my mom's, you know, in the law field. My, you know, my, 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 my uncle is a head guru of these like big New York companies. I need, I need to do that. So I get this job and first day on the job, no lie. Next thing I remember after my introduction to them is me getting nudged on the floor in the filing room because they put me in this like giant filing closet um, and I'm getting like nudged by someone and I'm hearing, Phil, Phil, I think you need to wake up. And I woke up because apparently I fell asleep in this filing closet and they were like, I don't think this is going to work. I was like, yep, me neither. From that day on, I accepted the fact that I was going to be an artist because any attempt that I had at trying to do something that wasn't how I was wired just didn't fulfill. Totally. Um, so, so, so that would be the first part. And then the second is a lot of times, you know, we are putting our heart into what we do. You know, like there's a lot of times where, you know, talk to a lot of jobs, you know, and they're like, oh, yeah, this is just procedure. It's just routine. You know, this is just what we do. Um, but with an artist, it's never just, oh, edit, copy, edit, paste. You're always putting something personal into it, you know? Um, so it's easy for us to feel misunderstood when we feel like someone doesn't get our art, you know? Um, so it's even more so for me, I believe, as a believer, when you feel like, the people that know you most, your local community, don't really get it mm. because you're like, man, if these people who like have helped shape my heart don't understand or care to understand, you know, what, what I'm putting out, then that hurts, you know? Um, so, so I think that that's where that quote makes sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really liked what you said. Um, and the aspect of wanting to be understood, uh, being sort of created that way, and I don't know if you said this explicitly or not, but you know that that desire to be understood feels sort of like a, a reflection of a characteristic of of the creator. You know, yeah. I mean, there's there's a there has to be a part of god that desires to be understood by his creation and in yeah. a way in the same way that an artist you know puts a little bit of themselves into their work and to have that misunderstood is is uh, you know is, is feels more personal than yeah. some other type of you know work related failure or something yeah. you can kind of see like in the in a similar way you know, God putting a just you know a bit of Himself into His creation, into us. Perhaps that's the desire to be uh, understood, and not being understood. You know, that's a that's a pretty heavy, that's a pretty heavy sort of chain of misunderstanding or understanding. Yeah. You know, c coming from the top to the bottom, and especially if you're trying to communicate something about God or, um, you know, in, in relation to God through your art, to have that misunderstood is not only, you know, having your work and your effort and your heart misunderstood, but it, it, it may, to some artists, you know, bring into question uh, sort of their ability to, to reflect God, yeah. uh, in that way. So I can, I can, it's just a heavy state of being, uh, yeah. for and, the and, artist. And I think there's, there, there's also a fine line, you know, and that's where, you know, accountability and, you know, community are, are huge. You know, there, there, there is the fact that we are creative and we, you know, one of the first characteristics you see of the father is that he is a creator, you know? So I feel like, that's definitely a gift that he's given to us. Um, but the, the, the major difference is regardless of the misunderstanding, 
um, the father's worth was never, you know, like right. in question, you know, whether or not someone understood. Um, yeah, it's a great us distinction. As, us as sinners, you know, or us as just being human, you know, that can shatter, you know. So having that community that reminds us like, hey, it does, you know, not feel great to be misunderstood, but let's remember that this is part of our characteristic uh, part of our character, but it's not our identity. You right. know, whether or not someone, you know, accepts your art or not, that doesn't change your identity, which is that you are a father, I mean, a, a son or daughter yeah. of the Most High. You know, so and, and ask, having mm. having that accountability is key, you know, and that, and that leadership and that guidance to have that constant reminder as an artist is huge. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah, certainly if anybody wants to create art in any sort of consistent manner that is presented to, you know, any version of the public. They got to get over the sort of self value evaluation yeah. based on external praise uh, pretty quickly or else the, the pain is just too much. Um, yeah. And yeah, you know, when it comes to that comparison of, of uh, God desiring to be un uh, understood and when his work is misunderstood, you know, uh, it's, I would expect, and I don't have a scriptural reference for this, but my, my heart tells me that, you know, God does not question his own valuation of his <laughs> yeah. art, but yeah. rather it's more of a, hmm, what is the feeling? It's a feeling of, oh, oh, I wish they understood for their sake. Yes. And yes. I've experienced that before with whether it's art or podcasting or whatever and and something is misunderstood and the person you know can be expressing any any range of emotions whether they're upset because they misunderstood something or they're confused or they're sort of uh, uh um what is the word pass uh, not passive but uh uh, uh, oh man oh lord what is the word <laughs> what is the word that i want dismissive or maybe they're dismissive of something yeah. because they didn't understand it there there have been times and lord help me it's not every time but there have been times where it's dawned on me it's like oh i really want them to understand because i feel like they would benefit so much from understanding and yeah. what i'm trying to say and whether there's uh, you know certainly possibility of some aspect of some hubris like i would have anything to teach anybody um but certainly in god's case you can see that being the case ah you don't understand my creation I really want you to understand my creation for your sake. There's so much there for you, uh, yeah. you know. So but you see, you, you see sort that of in the Jesus, other side of the coin. You know? I was you just see that in Jesus with the disciples. You know, <laughs> like how, like I, I've been walking with you for how long, and you still don't like get it. You know, like mm -hmm. it, it was that wanting them to understand. You know, and, and so, so I think that yeah, that that that's kind of a healthy thing as an artist is being like. Not so much that I want you to get it so that, like, I can be known or to, to gain recognition or this, that, or whatever, but I want you to get it because, like, there's fruit there. There's something for you specifically. Yeah, and in a way, you know, that, that we talked about, you know, the purpose of an artist in the intro to this series. And in a way, you know, an artist could see their purpose as communicating something for the benefit of the viewer or the listener or something like, sure. you know, if you're, if you're trying to um, motivate your art with something that would, you know, be healthier than other motivations, things like money yeah. and fame and uh, whatever. Uh, if your motivation is, ah, oh, I have something I have to communicate. I th believe, I feel so deeply that if someone were to understand what I'm trying to say with my art that, you know, I would feel good about it, but I would feel good because um, there's, I believe that there's such a benefit uh, to receiving this message. Yeah. And, you know, I think if we're talking about healthy and unhealthy ways to be an artist, that feels like a pretty strong motivation uh, that at least has a, a higher potential for aligning with maybe yeah. something authentic or something yeah. 
um, purposeful. Yeah, and that's good. Like so, so, so within the photography thing, you know, like I, I I've seen uh, 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 both ends of the spectrum. You know, I've had people that are like, "Hey, can I?" book a session with you for you to go over my portfolio so you can let me know what I'm doing to, you know, wrong so that I can start getting more business, you know? And I'm like, all right, sure, you know, let's do it. Um, but then I have a friend who reached out to me. He's a fellow videographer and he came out with this video and he sent me the link and was like, Hey Phil, I'm still like trying to get this finalized before I present it. Um, will you watch it and let me know what you think? Let me know if you understand what I'm trying to do here. And so the story was pretty much like a modern day, um, take on, you know, the story, um, uh, uh, of, of Abraham, you know, and like pretty much having, you know, children at a very, very ridiculously old age. Um, and he had, um, this older couple like presenting how ever since they were young, they struggled with infertility. And now she's like in her eighties or nineties and she goes to the doctor and they find out that she's pregnant. Um, and so he was trying to use modern day, you know, example to show what God was able to do, you know, and what God can still do if he wanted to. Um, but he sent me that video, not so I could praise the cinematic, like, um, aspects of the video, even those were great, but he did it because he wanted to make sure that every single person that watched it understood the story without having to be walked through like, Hey, this is what this is supposed to mean. Um, and so his heart and his desire was for that video to be understood, um, because he wanted Christ to get the glory through it. So I think that that is the healthiest way to, to tackle art is to say, Hey, yeah, I'm expressing something, but I also want to make sure that like the character of who I'm glorifying is made clear that my message is clear. It's really interesting because as, uh, you've been talking about, <clears throat> you know, uh, you know, for the last 10 or 15 minutes here, about kind of like the the life of an artist and even in your own kind of personal experience i've been as someone who is you know kind of professionally um a theologian uh and pastor at this point um it's uh it's interesting because all of the things that you were saying were like so relatable to me too where it was like you kind of and you've probably heard this before if you ever hear anybody talk about you know a call to ministry it's like most people usually uh, try to do everything else other mm -hmm. than, you know, be a minister yeah. first. Um, and then that just ends up being the one that it's just like, well, I guess the Lord's just not going to, he's just not going <laughs> to let me go on this. And I think really, you know, we, we associate that a lot of times with ministry, but it's interesting to hear you say that too, because um, there is, and not to get too like existential here, but I think that this is kind of almost a human experience, that there is something inside of every one of us that is like, the person that we are or the call that the Lord has placed on us. And sometimes it's the ministry. Um, and what's, you know, sometimes people will call that like a special kind of call, you know, and it's a unique and it's kind of more powerful or whatever. And I, you know, I don't know, I don't know how I feel about that. I think the Lord has a call for every person's life. And it was just interesting hearing you talk about kind of your, your calling into, you know, um, being an artist and then kind of it was interesting again because then there's this whole kind of thing about this deep desire to be understood and even as basil was saying like the benefit that people might even have if we could be so audacious to say it uh in understanding the thing that you have to say and i think that's that's a pastor's struggle every sunday morning and wednesday yeah. night and whenever you would have a meeting it's like uh you want to you want to be understood and then you're talking about putting your heart into kind of everything you're doing and i know that as i'm you know preparing sermons and even you know lectures at the college where i teach and all of those different things it's like you are putting everything that you have into it and then there is you know you're hoping that there's this kind of payoff where somebody has you know revelation and and the light shines on them and they understand and they have this moment this beautiful moment where they where they understand what it is you know that you're, that you're trying doves. to communicate well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and i was just thinking i was thinking to myself i was like man the struggle of an artist sounds a lot like the struggle of a of a pastor or a theologian and then it got me to thinking like 
I mean, I think it really is kind of kind of a core human desire, uh, which would be natural if it also comes from the Lord, as we were talking about, God's yeah. desire to be understood, that each one of us have a desire to be understood. Of course, it's typified in most teenagers, you know, that any of us that any of us know, but there is some kind of desire to be understood. And then, you know, that follows, you know, in our pursuits and maybe not so much, but when you've really become passionate about your calling and the thing that you're putting your hand to, then you do sort of really give everything that you have um, in producing that, whatever it is, or in, yeah. you know, whatever kind of, whatever kind of work that is. So I just, as I was listening here, I just thought it was really interesting that, you know, I kind of thought this, you know, even if we have listeners out there who might think, you know, like I'm not an artist, I've never created any piece of art. I don't have any kind of artistic, you know, yeah. fiber in my body. It's like these sorts of experiences I think are universal to kind of the human condition. Yeah. I think and, that's and, and, why that's what makes the artist so valuable is it, it at its at their best they are communicating some universal piece of the, you know humanity or god uh, that people inherently can connect with whether they are artists themselves or not. Yeah. And and, and I think two things on that. Um one, you know, when when you look at the scriptures, you know, the there there wasn't these like paid titles, you know, like I'm a paid pastor, you know, I'm a, I'm a this, I'm a that, you know, there was just calling on your life. You know, it, w w when you're looking at the gifts, uh, you know, that the, the father gives, it wasn't like, oh, you have a paid teaching position, you know, it was mm -hmm. like, no, you just have the gift of teaching. You just have the gift of, you know, whatever, hospitality, this, that, whatever, you know? So if the Lord has given us those gifts, that's where that passion is going to stem from, you know? So like yeah. Luke was a physician. Paul was declaring, you know, the goodness of God everywhere. But both of those people did it to their best of their ability and with a burning passion for people to understand the gospel in completely different ways. You know, Paul's the physician who's taking notes because he's educated, you know? Paul is the guy that's like, hey, I was killing you all. Now I need to talk to you about Jesus. You know, two completely different roles, but both the same kind of burning passion within their bones to glorify the Lord in what they were doing. Um, and so coming down to the not my will, but yours be done. And if that's the truth, then you want his will to be done in excellence. Um, and then the other part where, you know, you were like, if someone's listening, and they're not an artist. Well, if you're not an artist, that doesn't change anything because all of us have been affected by art in some way, shape or form. Yeah. Like there's no one listening to this. That's like, I've never listened to music in my life or I've never, you know, had a painting in my house. You know, um, we all are subject subjects, you know, subjective to art. Um, and, and, and so having that understanding of like, even if I may not be an artist, even more of a reason for me to support actual artists who glorify the Lord, because we know culture is affected through the arts. Why not like give the support that a, a believing artist needs so that they can do what they're doing to the full potential and glory of God and not have to worry about this, that, or whatever. Amen. Amen, brother. Amen. Well, we're, we're coming, we are approaching uh, sort of the time that we had set aside for this conversation, but I certainly don't want to cut it short. Was there anything um, that uh, was sort of burning on your heart that you were, uh, wanted to talk about or communicate to the people yeah, out there? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked. There has been something, okay. um, actually. <laughs> oh, was that for Phil? Nice. <laughs> for whoever. Well, Are you this being is a funny boy? this is for something? Phil too. I was, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I knew it was for Phil, but I, uh, but I can't can't let you go um, unless we talk about uh, another art form that you and I, Phil, share a passion for. And I don't know, perhaps Basil. We haven't talked about it on the show yet. This will be a first, but uh, that being cocktails. Mm, um, yes, sir. Yeah, as I was reviewing your Instagram in preparation for the show, I saw that you have a you have a section there uh, for cocktails, and you know it's it's very funny because I I know that it might be slightly scandalous, and some people might you know be teetotalers and and really believe that the Lord who created 
gallons and gallons of wine on a particular <laughs> occasion, you know, thinks that we should never drink any alcohol. But uh, I do um, enjoy a nice cocktail. And I was just wondering before we before we let you go and yeah. plug all the stuff that you do uh, about if you could if you could give me uh, maybe some of your best recommendations for cocktails here locally, because I know actually I think one time when I was in New York City, I had messaged you about the yep. best place in Manhattan to get yep. uh, a cocktail. I ended up, um, I don't remember the name of the place that you sent me, but it was right there by Times Square. You might remember the name because uh, you sent me there. But then I ended up down south of there, down at the Nomad. Oh, Have yeah, you been Nomad's there? amazing. Oh, my goodness. Love oh, Nomad. my goodness. I was <laughs> actually on my way to uh, to Scotland with uh, Michael, mutual friend, and ended up at Devil's Advocate. Um, and I would say probably had two of the best cocktails of my life at the Nomad and then Devil's Advocate there. But l- I want to hear I want to hear the best yeah. cocktail that you've ever had. And then give me just a couple pointers. This is just personal uh, here locally Ooh. in the Tampa Bay area besides like Ciro's or something like that. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, so here in Tampa, there's, uh, a, a few places. Um, so they have a place called gin joint downtown. Um, that is really, really good. Um, there is also, um, a spot in St. Pete during the day. They make coffee at night. It's cocktails intermezzo. Um, they're spot on also. Uh, and I want to go, there's a new place, um, in St. Pete called Dirty Laundry. That's a speakeasy that like fronts Mm. as a laundromat, um, that, that I'm trying to go to. Um, when it comes to best cocktail, that's hard because one of the things that I do is anytime I travel for work or for just personal reasons, I find a new cocktail bar to go to. Um, so for those people that don't think <laughs> alcohol is good. Please don't like void everything that I've said earlier. Um, <laughs> You're going to get blacklisted like all those Christian arts. artists earlier. Let the yeah, art uh, stand alone done. from the artist, folks. Yeah. <laughs> Just because he's a sinner doesn't mean that he had nothing good to say. Uh, but anyway, so some of my favorite places that you should check out is next time you're in New York, one of the most recent places I went to is called Pat and Pending. Um, mm. And oh my gosh, like drinks like nothing I've ever had before. Like very, very unique, very amazing craft cocktails. Um, and then one of mine and Krista's favorite, she went when we were in Nashville, her and a girl that we were with went Um, and so we stayed home with the kids and then when we were in New York, him and I went to the one in New York, it's a place called Attaboy. Um, and what they do is they just ask you what your favorite spirit is Uh and what some of your favorite drinks are. And then they make you whatever the heck they want to make you. Uh, you get no say in it. You just fully trust the bartender and it's absolutely incredible. They were spot on all night. Um, but it's actually been a little hard because I've taken, taken on like making craft cocktails and I like do some work for, you know, some different spirits, some different companies. Um, and so I've kind of taken it on myself. And the other day we went out to eat, uh, and my wife had a cocktail and she gave me a look and I was like, what? She's like, I'm kind of mad at you. And I was like, why? She's like, now when I go somewhere, I compare it to whether or not you could have made it better at home. (laughs) And if you could have made it better at home, like I don't enjoy it. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry. Bro, you're uh, going to have to have us down there here. Uh, do? Uh, soon yeah, bro. After the baby comes, we'll have to yes. come down for a celebratory. Yes, we'll have to. I, I, I make a different menu every month for when people come over. So th- three cocktails that are from different cocktail places that I love around you know, the country, and then one that I create myself. Wow, very cool. And just yes, for the people okay. who might be kind of like scoffing or wondering about this, I mean, it is an art form. If you ever have been to a very nice bar and you watch the baristas, or not baristas, the, uh, help me out, the bartender, the, whatever, the, the bartender, mixologist, whatever you want to call it. <laughs> if you have watched the bartenders make the make the drinks, I mean, it is 
it is an art form unto itself. And it's kind of, I mean, just like any other culinary, you know, you you have some delicious dish. I mean, you can, you can make a masterpiece in a little glass and serve it to a person. So anyway, I just wanted to, I just wanted to hear your take on that before we let you go. There you go, (laughs) folks. Even you, dear mixologists and cocktail (laughs) artists, you can strive (laughs) to communicate the deep, abyssal utterings of the divine whispers that flow through your soul towards the ears and the mouths and the minds of others in order to seek the transformation from merely earthly experience to divine revelation you heard it here from dr chris and phil we appreciate you coming on the show buddy it's been a real blast and uh let people know how they can um you know come in contact with more of your work yeah yeah so for everything photo wise you can go to philporto.com or instagram underscore phil porto p-o-r-t-o underscore um and that'll have like my youtube channel and all that stuff um and then yeah and for gospel in the arts it's just gospel in the arts.com or at gospel in the arts gospel and the arts okay there you go well phil thank you very much buddy this has been a real pleasure and everybody out there phil porto make sure to check out his work and his ministry over there at gospel and the arts and uh we'll have to keep in touch my friend yes sir and i gotta tell you man Mm -hmm. you know sitting here listening i'm like he's got a straight up like npr type voice (laughs) slash you know like game show host you know like from back in the day so yeah you you got something going with this podcast thing brother basil's the best in the biz (laughs) well that's definitely uh a a high compliment for someone like me i appreciate that very much my friend you're welcome man like that guys that was fun it was a good time did you hear me fall into the microphone you know i'm in someone a a wise man once called me the bob ross of podcasting and so i wanted to make sure that people really understand the range of podcasting uh you know the the forms that it can take and uh, that was a technique that i just invented it's called i call it the wily coyote you know, when Wiley Coyote runs off of a cliff and he's kind of going, but then he doesn't fall until he notices it. That's podcasting. None of that made that's any what, sense, but I suppose what that's what oh, makes it art. I'm such a misunderstood <laughs> artist, Christopher. If only uh, someone would understand what I'm trying to bring with my art. And we've come full circle. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> we, we're, you're getting good at that, Chris. You know, as much as as much as I may be the Bob Ross of podcasting, you are um, getting better and better every episode. Yeah. Well, um, praise the Lord. It's really all about just listening and having fun, you know? Boom. Yes, and that's sure. art, people. Mm. All right, mm. let's talk about this. Uh, let's do an outro. <laughs> you want to do an outro for this episode? I guess uh, we should put a bow on it here. Yeah, I was I was not aware that you and Phil were such close friends. Uh, yeah, well, not not a super close again, but definitely uh, have have a bit of a history, and you know, hadn't actually spoken with him in, in a while, so it was a nice chance to be able to. Uh, reconnect but yeah he's a he's just a really good dude and um i just again when in in thinking about this topic i thought he'd be he'd have a really great perspective to bring on here so um he did. yeah uh and it's one of those things too you know where i don't ever consider myself to be um an, an artist really and in, in any uh real specific form um perhaps in some kind of latent one maybe i am but um I always love hanging out with and spending time with people, you know, that have creative minds and creative ways of expression and, and people who are very talented. It's just, it's just fun to have those kinds of people, 
um, in your life. So Phil, yes, you know, I have been privileged uh, that he's been in my life to whatever extent um, that it has been. And uh, yeah, he's a great guy. Go make sure that you guys follow his work. Uh, at least at the very least, give him a follow on um, Instagram and things like that uh, at Phil Porto and then Gospel in the Arts. Um, you won't be disappointed. You'll just have random beautiful pictures show up in your feed every once in a while that you're not expecting. Mm-hmm. Indeed. Yeah, it really was sort of a parallel journey while the listener was uh, engrossed in sort of a, an exploration of art and artists. I was being led step by step down a sort of cobblestone path of, wait a second, it sounds like Chris and this guy know each other. <laughs> Did I not pay yeah. attention to that beforehand? Oh, uh, yeah. I thought I told uh, you that part. Good stuff. Yeah. No. no. You may have. You may have. Only about, like, uh, unless I'm recording a podcast. I'm When I'm recording, my listening brain is turned on and uh, operating at full capacity. When I'm not actively, when the record button is not going, um, I pretty much retain about 37% of anything that I hear. <laughs> Oh gosh, I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to explain that to my wife and say that I'm not the only one. Mm. Remember mm. the conversation we had about the dinner plans that we have tonight? And I was like, "What mm -hmm. was I doing when you told me about that?" Mm. Yeah, <laughs> I yeah, don't remember. I probably, probably would recommend uh, caution while trying to employ my excuse. I'm, yeah, that. I'm gonna say Basil said it happens to him too. <laughs> well, Basil said it's okay. Don't do that. I will always take her side, Chris. Yes, I know. All right. There we go. I think that's enough of an, <laughs> enough of an outro. It's Was there an outro. Else? And it, it is, this has officially been a podcast episode. Um, and I think a pretty good one, but you know, uh, beauty's in the ears of the beholder. Um, so go check out Phil Porto stuff. Thank you for uh, tuning in. Uh, to our mini series on and about and with artists. Artists on. Oh, well, yeah, we didn't mention that in the intro. We've now officially named the mini series Artists On. By the time you hear this, dear listener, there's been like three episodes out, and we recorded those episodes not knowing what this was going to be called. So that's time travel. That's how time travel works. <laughs> And thanks for listening to this episode of Ravel. Make sure to tune in next week where we will have another awesome episode for you. Chris, you have anything to say for yourself? Godspeed. <laughs> thanks for listening to Ravel. To learn more about who we are, what we believe, or how to support this ministry, visit our website at ravelpodcast.com. If you have a question you would like answered on the show or to let us know how we're doing, email us at contact at ravelpodcast.com. This project is made possible by the prayers and generosity of listeners just like you. You'll see all kind of things happening on your canvas, and very soon you learn to use all these beautiful little things that happen. I think in one of the earlier shows I mentioned, we don't we don't make mistakes. We have happy accidents. <laughs> <laughs>